Welcome back to the Wood Offshore Europe 2023 podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Clark, and I'm joined by Matthew Morley, Business Development Director at Wood, and Rebecca Allison, Chief Operating Officer at Net Zero Technology Centre. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Um, in this episode, we discuss energy security challenges and the enduring role that hydrocarbons will play in our energy system. However, the need to deliver this energy with the lowest possible carbon intensity remains critical. So energy security challenges over the last 18 months have brought some greater pragmatism around the enduring role that hydrocarbons will play in our future energy mix. I just wanted to ask you both, um, you know, we, obviously we know that hydrocarbons will be part of our energy mix for some time to come. But how do you think we ensure that we are offering energy security at the same time as lowering carbon emissions? So from my perspective, you know, energy security, it came right up the agenda, obviously, with all the, the different conflicts and the cost of living crisis. And I think we are all agree that hydrocarbons need to play the part. But I also think there's a little bit of a different approach we need to look at it. And we need to look at the energy demand. And everybody needs to start looking at how much energy do we need. Because, yeah, hydrocarbons will fill the gap as long as we are needed to, to create that energy. But we don't really educate to say, how do we use less of it? That will help reduce the carbon intensity, but also just make it a little bit a nicer place to live. So, yeah. Exactly. No, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd broadly agree with that. And, um, yes, where energy security came from out of the blue but it's been quite useful in that it's brought a bit more pragmatism to the conversation you know 18 months ago it was like no 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 everything hydrocarbons is bad demonized and i think it's starting to change and it's enabling us to have the conversation about what does low emissions really mean does it mean no emissions or does it mean the lowest we can get to practically you know, and not spending far too much money. Um, and, and it's good to be able to have that conversation. And it's good that the, I suppose you could say, the public conversation is moving a little bit as well. Um, because again, we think about the developments in the U from a UK perspective. You know, we think about the developments that are out there at the moment. You know, like some of those back in Cambo and the amount of noise around them. Well, that P you know, 18 months ago, 24 months ago, when, when Shell pulled out. And, and now it is it is a different tone. So yeah. hopefully we can move forward and be a bit more rational about things. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we have this kind of trilemma where we need to ensure energy security, but we need affordability and we also need to transition um, to low carbon, you know, to meet the UK's target of net zero by 2050. How do you think we can decarbonize existing oil and gas assets and make them fit for a low carbon future? It, again, it's it's an area where we need to be pragmatic about it because there's different challenges, you know, whether it's offshore or onshore, um, for the decarbonization of offshore assets. You know, you've got all the, the limitations around space and weight and working there. But again, it's in part it's how do you look at the problem? You know, what does it mean to decarbonise an asset, an oil and gas asset? Well, surely what we're doing is we are improving its operational efficiency. And through that, we'll have the benefit of decarbonising it. Um, so it's about right-sizing the equipment that we've got on a platform. And it's about, you know, every person that you remove the need for going offshore, you are helping to decarbonise the asset. And it's, it's things that we should be looking at anyway. And I think um, the industry looks at these things anyway. But what we can do with that decarbonisation lens, or maybe I'll just talk about reducing the carbon intensity of production, is we can challenge ourselves on some things that we previously said no to. We're not doing that. Well, actually, no. If we say yes, we will tick off a number of things. Okay, we may need to spend a little bit more money. But again, we're having a rational conversation. Yeah, 100%. And to maybe take it a slightly different viewpoint, why do we need to decarbonise every asset? If you actually looked at the ones that we need as part of our energy security, invest the money, invest the technology, use those as the benchmark, 
and the others that are not going to make it, the ones that are marginal, let them run their natural course. We may have to decommission early. I know everybody's going, oh, why would we do that? That's a terrible decision to make. But actually, we're spreading ourselves too thin. So let's concentrate on the areas we want to invest and the others we embrace, they're not going to get to net zero. They're going to help that short-term energy demand, but give them some, you know, help along the way, but just actually say it's not worth it and then get yeah, potentially shut them in earlier than we originally planned. Very different approach to it, but it's maybe one of those grown-up conversations we need to have and say, yeah, let's take this as a pragmatic approach and then educate people to say that's why we're making this decision. And if I could just add a little something to that, it's a lot of it's about, again, value for money. You know, we want to spend a pound, right, how, what impact is that going to have? How much carbon can we eliminate for that? A pound spent offshore won't be as effective as a pound spent onshore. You know, again, when we look at in the North Sea at some of the electrification schemes, you know, it's fantastically worthy schemes, very expensive, very complicated. So you spend $500 million doing a grouping of platforms. Gosh, you could achieve an awful lot spending that money on all the refineries in the UK. You know, and so it's bang for buck. Yeah, sure. No, some really interesting takes on that one for sure. Um, so yeah, what, from what we discussed, you know, we can see there's obviously there are options for, for lowering the carbon output of, of the existing assets um, that are there. Um, and we know, um, so for example, the the Independent Climate Change Committee predicts that around a quarter of the UK's energy demand will still be met by oil and gas when the UK reaches net zero in 2050. Um, what do you think we can put in place now that will ensure any future oil and gas developments are emitting the lowest possible carbon to help achieve that 2050 goal? It's, well, we keep using the term being pragmatic, isn't it? Um, you know, we can be... As an engineering company, it's about asking the right questions. Okay, so we need to be empowered to ask the right questions. And that means our clients need to be on the same page. Because again, you know, we operate in a competitive environment. We all have to bid and win work, right? engineering studies, execute phase work. If you operate in an environment where the lowest price bidder is going to win a piece of work, you're not necessarily going to have the right approach or you're not necessarily going to be able to ask the difficult questions. Um, because, again, you're looking at, you're looking at the, the carbon impact of the project for its totality of its life cycle, and that starts in its construction. You know, how do we go about, where do we buy equipment from? Where do we have the facilities constructed? What's the carbon footprint of that? You know, it's, it's starting right at the beginning. And we talked earlier about you know, removing operating personnel. Yeah. Those decisions, it's about the digital life of a project. And I know we keep talking about digital twins and it's a much banded about word that a lot of people don't understand. But it's an enabler for, for as he said, challenging the customers or challenging the clients. We think we need to put this in there and it's going to cost you to do that. You wouldn't normally. But it will give you the all these benefits. Um and when you say that, that, and it is, that's more, it's a, we talk about collaboration a lot um, in the industry. Yeah. And, it, and I think it, it, we have to, because again, it's engaging the supply chain as well, because, you know, we as engineers, we specify something. Okay. We're following a client's spec. So it's that pump. But actually that supplier, let's talk to them. Let's not treat them as a transactional vendor because they've got something new. That will improve you because it needs less maintenance, less emissions associated with it. Sure. Um, and if you get in an environment where you can have that conversation, I think it will support us because then we can say we can safely say we have done everything possible through the design of the project to drive out emissions and to drive down the carbon intensity production. Yeah. And yeah, I totally agree in the sense of is look at the different materials. Reuse, repurpose options, build for the future rather than the, to the lowest price. And all of that will help contribute to, you know, future projects and making sure that they're as low as they can go or to net zero as we can get to them. And then that obviously embrace that and also learn from other industries. We 
sometimes, and we say this a lot, we don't look to the other industries and learn, but we need to, we're all in the same problem. You know, whether it's from the marine logistics to the aviation industries, they're going through these same challenges as well. You know, all these high sort of CO2 emitting industries, let's learn from each other. And maybe, and as we've talked about this in a few, as I've noticed a few things going around here today, talking about it, standardisation, simplifying some of our processes and some of the the equipment that we use or we design for. Yeah. So a lot of that does need to be brave. First mm-hmm. adopters, early adopters. And also sometimes that comes with a higher price point. But then if you're looking at the full life cycle of the project, just rather than the traditional engineering uh, contracting methods we've had in the past, then that also sometimes comes with a different challenge. But yeah, having that conversation, having the collaboration, as we talk about all the time, that you know, don't always get off the ground. But yeah, maybe this is the time that we can come together as a community and say, we can make a difference. I, I, I like the, um, the observation about learning from other industries as well. And these are some of the conversations I've been having recently. Um, when you look at some of the um, carbon capture clusters in the UK, you know, in the Humber or Teesside or wherever. And we keep we think about them, they, they are hydrocarbon projects. Mm. But there's a lot of them that need to happen at the same time. So we need to think about it differently. Actually, it's an infrastructure project that just happens to have, you know, hydrocarbon types engineering skills because we've got pipes and vessels and processes. You know, so look at the best case examples in infrastructure. We're difficult in the UK because, you know, we don't have a great reputation of over even how it's set up, like HS2 is set up, how Terminal 5 was delivered, you know, they went, where they try different models that in part can be very, very effective. But it needs different operators to talk to each other, which, as we know, in the UK is not necessarily straightforward. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, it's interesting. I think we've we've established that pragmatism around this conversation and collaboration are definitely two two key things that that we need to make this happen. Um, so I'm just going to ask you our our closing questions. Um, so the theme for Offshore Europe uh, 2023 is accelerating the transition to a better energy future. What does that mean to you? So to me. Two, two things, actually. It's a fantastic opportunity for everyone. And I, you know, if anybody hears me talking and some of those things, I have a real passion for STEM, bringing in new talent into the industry. So that means something to me, that accelerating transition. We can open the doors to the emerging talent that's out there. You know, everybody's a bit worried about jobs at the moment. Where's the energy future going to take me? How do we attract that new talent? But actually, if we sell it and say, show them where... I think, come to your point, this is an engineering problem. Mm-hmm. These are engineering problems. And engineers are good at solving them. So that, to me, is a great opportunity. And from my own perspective as well, what an exciting place to work right now. You know, we're at this pivotal point of going, we don't know we're going to be the hydrogen cluster of the future or carbon capture or even just supporting a really difficult to abate industry. Mm-hmm. But it's so much needed, maybe not forever, but certainly to bridge that gap. So just look at it go, yeah, Aberdeen, North East of Scotland, UK. Let's just embrace it and do what we're good at. We were, we've been good at engineering in the past. We need to just remember that we are good at engineering. Yeah, I would agree with everything said there. It's, it's around, I mean, part of the opportunity we have is to change the perception of what we do. And it's not dirty oil and gas is bad but it's we do have the skills to solve these problems we also have the skills to think about how collectively the projects can be delivered because again that's one thing we haven't touched on today is around the supply chain constraints you know it's all very well and good having the targets that we know we have to hit 2030 2050 so many gigawatts of hydrogen so many gigawatts of offshore wind but you can't divorce targets from the reality. And again, we've got to be quite pragmatic about that. And, but it's, I think we have an opportunity now of shaping that conversation, um, you know, because we have, we as an industry have to solve it. And one of the ways of solving it is through standardization. You know, why should every single project be different the way every single oil and gas project is different? 
why can't we have a template that can be implemented? You need less labour, you need less construction resources, you can build them in factories. And it's, it is, it's, it is the chance to think differently and to really challenge ourselves about what we really need to do to meet the, the, the schedule because that's not moving. And the longer we delay and faff, and I think we're doing a lot of that, um, we, we, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Some really, really great insights there from you both. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, that brings our decarbonizing upstream oil and gas podcast to a close. Um, yep, yeah, thank you to our contributors, Matthew and Rebecca. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>